and for all this uh, yeah for for delaying the the, the meeting but uh, uh, i think you want to the opportunity to come and present before you again uh, yeah, my name is Brian Jerry. My I am a senior clinical specialist MR radiographer and a practice educator facilitator for uh, the trust I work for in the United Kingdom. So uh, today uh, I was thinking of talking about uh, cardiac MR and uh, its use in a diagnosis uh, of cardiomyopathies. Uh, so uh, I'll just give an opening statement, basically that uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging is, uh, and cardiac computed uh, uh, tomography after offer advantages for detecting left and right uh, ventricular dysfunction in patients with or suspected of heart failure. So uh, cardiac MR and CT offer those advantages of detecting left or right ventricular dysfunction in patients who are suffering from suspected heart failure or have heart failure. But at the moment, can, uh, cardiac uh, magnetic resonance imaging is the current code standard for non-invasive imaging assessment of cardiac anatomy, function, advanced myocardial tissue characterization. So, you know, uh, uh, you know cardiac uh, magnetic resonance imaging actually does not expose patients to ionizing radiation as we know, and it's quite well suited for functional assessments and for serial studies. Uh, when, when I talk about serial studies, I'm talking about the surveillance that takes place in patients that we follow up for different cardiac problems. So indeed, the uh, cardiac computed tomography provides high spatial resolution useful for identification of coronary arteriosclerosis associated with the uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. So tonight, the clinical applications of C, uh, CMR, which is cardiac cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging, will be discussed to examine the strengths, to outline the techniques, as well as the uses of evaluation of cardiomyopathy in heart failure patients with either reduced ejection fraction or preserved ventricular ejection and valvular heart disease. So uh, basically, uh, our objectives today is that I have to look at uh, the Zambia uh, uh, coronary heart disease statistics, and also that we'll look at the basics of cardiac MR imaging, understanding that planning is different from generic MR imaging, and the types of cardiomyopathy, and the significance of cardio cardiovascular uh, magnetic resonance imaging in cardiomyopathy, and also the importance of parametric mappings in cardiomyopathy. So the statistics, uh, coronary statistics for statistics for coronary heart disease in Zambia are such that uh, we have a lot of deaths occurring, about 5,198 deaths a yearly, and also the percentage is about 4.67% of all deaths in the country in a year. So we have uh, an age adjusted rate of death being at 98.84 per 100,000 people of the population of the country. We are ranked 126 you know, among us countries that people are dying from cardiac uh, diseases. And this is according to the WHO statistics of 2018. So when you look at that, you realize that uh, the number of people that die from uh, cardiac related heart diseases, uh, but almost 6,000 is quite, quite a huge number per year. And the percentage has been increasing to about 4.67. And uh, you're talking of about uh, 98 people out of the 100,000, probably of the population dying of you know, coronary heart diseases in the country. So it is actually a big, big problem in the country much as because of the finance, finances of the country, as well as the, uh, some of the issues that we have in terms of provision of the service, indeed people are suffering with this kind of uh, situation. So it's very, very important to start looking at it. And also for those who haven't been exposed to magnetic resonance imaging of the cardiovascular diseases, this will be an opportunity to have at least a basic understanding or a basic idea of how to go about the program or how to go about planning 
and uh, doing the cardiac MRs and to help resolve or diagnose our people and that they can get treatment because lack of diagnostics also you know hinders progress and patient management. So uh, we're going to have an overview. So why should we do uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging? In people with cardiomyopathy, for instance, you know, and what, what what is our understanding of the cardiac anatomy, and how does the blood flow in card, you know, in the heart and you know, into the whole body, and what are the strengths of cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging, and also how do we plan or basic planning? Then we're going to dwell into cardiomyopathy and the types and the significance of cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging with parametric maps and uh, you know extracellular volume measurements in diagnostic diagnosing of cardiomyopathy today so when you talk about uh parametric mappings we're talking about t1 t2 and t2 stir and then the extracellular volume measurements you know in in absolutes basically so why cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging basically we do uh cardiac magnetic resonance imaging to try to exclude and to check for congenital heart diseases uh, like uh, Turner syndrome, you know, transposition of greater arteries, you know, tetralogy of fallow and the like. We also do cardiovascular magnetic uh, uh, resonance imaging to exclude coronary heart disease such as CARD. We also do CMR to look at heart failure, such as, you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, as I said earlier, you know, STEMIs, which is basically ST elevation myocardial infarction, and non STEMI myocardial infarction. We also do cardiac uh, MR imaging to try to rule out inflammatory diseases processes of the heart, such as amyloid, sarcoid, and the like. We also look at doing CMR to exclude heart attacks or to check for any damage from any heart attack that has taken place. You know, we also look at that to look at heart valve defects, heart muscle conditions, such as cardiomyopathy, that is dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. When you talk about half, uh, heart valve defects, we're talking about people who, instead of having three uh, clasps of uh, the, the you know, being trilithlet valves, they end up having two, where two of them are fused to make one and then the other to make what we call uh, a valve, which is basically bilateral, you know, a, a, a BAV, basically. So it's basically what we call, yeah, you know, a heart valve. Instead of having a trilithlet, it has two leaflets, basically. So this is why we're going to talk about those. So basically, SEMA is used to check for congenital heart defects, as I said, coronary heart diseases, heart failure, inflammatory disease processes of the heart, heart attacks, and checking for any damage from any previous heart attacks, heart valve defects, muscle, heart muscle conditions such as uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and the hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. So we cannot talk about the heart without talking about the anatomy of the heart. We need to understand anatomy before we can actually go into imaging. So you've got a picture there, so it's just on the left side of my screen, which is showing how the heart sits. So the location of the heart basically sits in the chest, and indeed it is very, very much in the center, and one third of it protrudes to the left because the heart lies very oblique. You know, and it is surrounded by lungs, and uh, also we've got some greater vessels up there over the heart at the top, which is basically the base. So when you look at that, there is another picture which is actually showing the layers of the pericardium and the heart wall. We can see that you know, in here, if you can see my my mouse nicely, we have this blue thing that's showing, which is actually the epicardium. And we've got the red thing here, which is the myocardium, and then we have the endocardium there. So these are the muscles of the heart. So this is like a chunk of the heart taken out to demonstrate how the heart layers are. So what is the heart? You know, how do you define a heart? What can we say or describe? How do we describe the heart? 
So a heart is actually a muscular organ about the size of a closed fist, which functions as the body's circulatory pump. It pumps the blood through the network of arteries and veins that make up the circulatory system. So the heart plus circulatory system gives us what we call the cardiovascular system. So it is located in the thoracic cavity, medial to the lungs and posterior to the sternum. The true position of the heart in the body is very oblique. So hence why I said when you're doing MR of the cardiac of the heart, the generic imaging that we do in a, in, a, in a human body are very different from the heart because the heart lies very oblique. So the best of the heart is actually at the superior portion, which is which is actually at the top. And uh, just go back to so when you look at the heart here, so this is the base here and the apex at the bottom there. So the base of the heart is very superior and it lies superiorly. And that is where the attachments of the aorta, pulmonary arteries, veins, and the vena cava. So, so the base of the portion uh, of the heart projects slightly to the right of the sternum with the apex you know, resting superior to the diaphragm and turned downwards projecting to the left of the sternum. So approximately a third of the heart's mass is on the left side of the uh, third is on the right side and two thirds of the heart mass is on the left. Hence why when we're younger, people would say the heart is on the left, but it's just two thirds of it that protrudes to the left. This oblique orientation affects the locations of the heart chambers relative to each other. So most superior and posterior chamber is the left atrium. The RV is the most anterior chamber and the LV is the most inferior chamber as the superficial portions form the apex of the heart, as you know. So when you talk about the anatomy there, so we're gonna talk about the anatomy definitely because when you look at the heart as it is, I'll use this black and white picture there. So we do have those chambers. We have the left, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left atrium and the right atrium. So above that one, we have the CSVC, which is superior vena cava, and the IVC, which is the inferior vena cava. So basically, the blood flows into the, into the heart this way. It flows from the venous flow, venous blood comes and enters into the, from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. So SVC and IVC comes into the right atrium and then goes through the, the right atom into the right ventricle via this pulmonic valves, which is labeled T there. You know, via the, the tricuspid valve, sorry, which is labeled T there into the right ventricle. And from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery via the pulmonic valves or what they call the semilunar valves. So once it does that, blood enters from SVC, IVC into right atrium via the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery via the pulmonic valves or the semilunar valves. So from there, it goes out to the lungs for purification and it comes back and enters the heart uh, via the pulmonary veins, which is this one here. I don't know, I don't know if I can see it. This one here. So it comes from there and gets into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and into the aorta after it has been purified and full of oxygen and nutrients via the aortic valves here and into the aorta and to the rest of the body. So So we've talked about the cardiac anatomy, basically we've talked about the four chambers, the left, right atrium, the left atrium, the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and then we have all these uh, greater arteries like the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary vein, uh, the aorta, the SVC and IVC. But one thing I haven't talked about is the, the, the divide between the, the ventricles. So we have what you call the intraventricular you know, uh, septum here in the middle here. So the septum is right in the middle. 
So this muscle, if you look at the heart, you realize that the left-sided side of the heart, which is the left ventricle, the muscles are thicker than the right ventricle. The reason as to why is because this left ventricle muscles or the myocardium on the left ventricle is the heartbeat of the heart. This is what actually squeezes the heart, the blood out of the, the, the heart into the aorta and to the rest of the body. So it has to work very hard. Hence why it is th thicker muscles here. So it's thicker muscles there and less thicker muscles on that side. So, so now we've known that uh, this is how the, the anatomy is and that is why the heart looks the way it is. And that's why the muscles on the left ventricle are thicker than the right because it is that part of the body that actually squeezes the heart and indeed releases the blood volume from the left ventricle into the iota, iota via the aortic valves. So what are the strengths of card, uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging? So the strengths of cardiovascular mag uh, magnetic resonance imaging are that there is no ionizing radiation involved, as you know, because MRI uses the protons and it uses a very superconducting magnet to try to give us pictures. So basically what happens is that because the human body is made up of water, fat, and bones, all of those do contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but we do have an abundance element of hydrogen in the human body. And because we have that, indeed we use those because hydrogen are the same as protons. So we try to magnetize those and make them into small magnets by excitation. And once we excite them, then we have a differences in terms of the energy levels where other, other, other protons will have higher energy and the other ones will have lower energy and they are aligned into the body, some towards the head and some towards the feet. So once we excite those by switching on the RF frequencies, then we actually, because the protons do possess charge and they do possess spin, we start spinning them. And then as they, as they dephase, when you switch off the RF pulse, then we can measure. So once we measure the, the decay, then it gives us what we call a T2. And when we measure the recovery, it gives us a T1 image. And then when you measure the decay and indeed consider it with the magnet inhomogeneities, we get a T2 star image. So this is just basically brief MR physics at the moment. So the cardiac MR uh, gives us no ionizing radiation because it uses the magnet and it has got unlimited planes. And also it gives us what we call a multi-parametric study. And this multi-parametric study is actually unparalleled for functional, anatomical, edema, and scar imaging. Also cardiovascular magnetic resonance imaging also gives us excellent non-invasive ischemia testing. When you talk about stress studies and start with the adenosine or debutamine. We do use stress, you know, instead of stressing the patient in other ways, we we'll still put the patient on the table, lying on there, give them adenosine or the vitamin, and they'll feel like they are exercising. And then we can measure, we can, we can do the imaging of the heart and see how the vessels are working and how the heart is coping under stress. And indeed, the other strength of cardiovascular uh, magnetic resonance imaging is that it is very, very highly reproducible. So basically what happens is that if we do a scan today, the patient goes and comes back, we can try to reproduce what we produced initially and we'll be able to reproduce the results and see if there is uh, progress or no progress. Hence why we use it in uh, surveillance or what they call uh, retesting. So how do we go about doing uh, an MRI? Uh, uh, some of, uh, I don't have to go into details because I didn't have much time. I just thought I'll just skim through some of the things and show the plannings and how you go about it. And then from there, we can talk about cardiomyopathy and the, the importance and clinical significance of parametric mappings in that. So uh, before we do a, a cardiac MRI, we need to get the heart. We need to, uh, to, to put some ACG dots on the chest and try to look at the heart and see how the heart is working and then be able to take pictures according to a certain bit of the heart. And you know, most of the time we use bits to take heart, uh, take the scans. So the getting here, as you can see, we've got a chest torso here of a human being here. And then uh, 
we have one there, which is actually a white, which we put on the right hand side of the patient over the clavicle. And then we have another one that goes onto the, the green one onto the fourth intercostal uh, muscle, this one there. No, yeah, and then we have one below the nipple, which is basically that one, and then the one that's in the mid axillary line. Uh, uh, the reason that's why I've showed you some, this, this picture is that where I work, we used to have a GE scanner, which never had uh, ECGs uh, uh, or the, the Peru or the what they call the physiological ECG and respiratory unit was quite different from the Siemens that I now use. So this is taken from a Siemens scanner. We use that because it has got quite long uh, cables to allow us to put it that way and we get really good ECG getting. So beforehand, we just used to put, stick the dots just right in the middle here, in the middle of the heart. So even our getting was not great, that's a GE one, but we are now use the Siemens era 1.5 Tesla, which actually allows us to do this. So this is how we position the leads. And sometimes if they, when you look at the gating and it's not working well, you can just try to choose and select which ECG leads you wanna check when once you're doing the scans, you can change from ECG one to ECG two to ECG three to just check which has got the best you know, outcome and best beat before you can actually continue to do the scans. So once you've done that, you've put your patient on the table, you've put the ECG doors there, you've connected them to contrast if you're using contrast and you've put a coil over the chest and then given them the headphones for the instructions obviously because we'll be doing a lot of breath hold instructions for the cardiac scanning. You now put the patient in the, in the magnet to start the scans. So the basic planning views. So we do have basic planning views. When you look at MR as it were, Indeed, uh, the generic planning in MR is very different from how we do the scans of the heart because a standard axial and sagittal chrono views, we use them to just start as localizers. Where I work, we do have a few localizers around before we can actually start doing the scenes and we get into the business end of the cardiac scanning. What we do is we use like a star, just a, the first scans, which you call the localizer, basically just a standard axial, a sagittal image and the corona view. And when we do that, you know, that's how we go about it. But this is just the basic start. Once you've done that, you go to a second localizer, which we call the isocentering localizer. Basically you're trying to get the heart in the isocenter of the magnet before you can actually start doing your, your scans. So once you do that, then the generically things change. You stop scanning, looking by the human body as we do in MRI generic uh, imaging. We start looking at the card, the cardiac, uh, the, ve the, the ventricles, the, the valves, and just the obliquity of the heart to do the scans. So the cardiac imaging plans are double oblique planes oriented to the heart chambers and valves. So when we're trying to scan, we're actually looking at orienting our, our uh, orientations to the obliquity of the heart to try to look through the chambers and to look through the valves because that's where the problems do exist. Some planes, in fact, they may mimic those of echocardiography and cather cardiac catheterization, as you know. So this is the basic planning. So where I work, we use an axial fiesta breath hold. And sometimes, you know, a consultant does change things to see either want to have a black blood or white blood, uh, you know, images. So we do this. So this, as you can see, this is just a, a plain localizer, which was done initially, which is actually a corona image. Then we have a sagittal image there. Then And, the, and then we, we should have actually a, an axial image, which is basically, that that one in the corner. So when you look at the uh, this corona image, the lines are I'm trying to scan from the top of the heart, just above to just show the vessels, the greater arteries, and down to the whole heart and into partly into the liver. This we do because we want to just check if there's any transposition of other uh, organs in the body or dextrocardia. So this helps us to look at those things. And if there's any transposition of the organs, then it changes the whole ball game. So this gives an idea of where we are and what we're scanning. So when you look at the, 
the, uh, the sagittal image is basically from the top down there and to cover the whole heart. And those pictures do give us this other picture here, which I can see, which is actually an axial. So this axial, you can see that there is an element of the, the lungs at some point. I can't really show nicely there. Well, I can't see where I can, where am I, where am I? I cannot see where my mouse is. So you can see uh, the lungs there, the heart, the heart there, the iota there, and the obviously the vertebral body there. So as we do that, this gives us like a four, like a four chamber, almost like you know, a, a, a modified four chamber view. So for us to get to do uh, a two chamber, we'll use that. Uh, we we'll use this four chamber with this modified four chamber here and and plan across along like, like as the green line is demonstrating so we plan along the green line which is going to give us a two chamber view followed by this arrow so if you see from what we're planning this keeps going yeah from the four uh, from a modified four chamber we scan through and show this green line here, we get this picture here, which is actually a two chamber. This two chamber is not a proper cine two chamber. This is just a two chamber localizer. As I said, in cardiac imaging, we do loads of localizers before we actually get the business end of the scanning. So from the localizer, which is like a, uh, like a chrono and a sagittal anaxio, we're able to get a two chamber. So from the two chamber, which we actually had, and the same oblique uh, four chamber that we get, we will be able to get a short axis. So basically, when I look at, when you look at this picture here, this is a two chamber that we got, a two chamber localizer. But also, because we do other, other scans that we do like short axis, so in this case, when you look at this picture here, you know that's a two chamber localizer. So you, these yellow lines here are actually the planning scans and here they, they are in green. They are the same lines to give us this picture here, which is actually a short axis of the heart. So we're using the, the long axis two chamber here and the long axis four chamber here to get a short axis chamber here. So this short axis chamber gives us a picture like that. This is a series of pictures, and we have about eight to 10 images of that normally. So when we get that, we do have this, it looks like an eye and a beak there. So we, we call it the puffin head. A puffin is a bird, so we call it the puffin head. So the puffin head basically is what we can see like, You've got the, an eye there and a beak there. So when you're planning to get a proper four chamber, you have to go through the beak here. You have to go through the beak, which is that one, and then through the middle of that one. So basically, when you look at the picture like that, this here is the ventricle, left, uh, left ventricle, right ventricle. So when we, when we do that, we can take that and then get a four chamber. So when we do a picture like that, we get a picture like this one. This is the proper four chamber. So this is the result of planning from here. It gives you this picture here. So as you can see, when I'm planning a four chamber, you have to use the two chamber localizer, which actually you got, which is this one here. They say it's the same as that one. It's just that I took it from different patients. I didn't have proper uh, pictures on that one. So I was quite running, you know, a bit at, uh, 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 a bit late to, to just to get pictures. So I had to get a different patient's picture basically to try and get pictures uh, together for us. So these two chamber and this two chamber, they are the same, except they are different patients, as you can see. So you go through the two chamber, you go through the, the ventricles and the, the, uh, the, atria, uh, the atria there. So the ventricles are the bottom here and the atria there. So you go through the midline and just cut it through there. And then you orient it to the short axis, which is basically the same. As, as the one I talked about. So you go through the beak and through the middle and you get 
this picture here, which is a four chamber. And the four chamber, we call it the four chamber because you've got the left ventricle here, the right ventricle here, right artery, the atrium there, and left atrium there. So these are the four chambers of the heart. So the left ventricle, right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium and they make us four chambers. So we've got the two chamber, which is basically the ventricles here and the atria there. So once you've got that, now we can actually plan the next thing. So we go, when we finish those, then we have to use these localizers that we got, which is actually a four chamber, which is more like a real four chamber, as I told you earlier, and we'll get a two chamber, a real two chamber, which is basically this one. This two chamber is we get it by dissecting here. You just cut a line instead of this way, you cut it like that. So if you look on the path in here, which is a short axis localizer, I want you to focus on that image so I can show you how we cut it. So we cut it from top down like that to get a picture like this which is a two chamber. So once you get the two chamber, the four chamber and the short axis localizers, then we can now go into the business end with doing scenes because now the scenes are the business end of the scans to show uh, proper anatomy function as well as any other infiltration and the like. So, My, my slide is stuck a little bit. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so Cine imaging. So Cine imaging, as I told you from earlier, we've got in the four chamber here. We've got the puffing head there, which is short axis, and we've got the two chamber. So when you're getting a two chamber, it's basically going to use the four chamber here and just cut it from the apex going all the way through the vent left ventricle and left uh, atria. You're going through there, cut it like that, and on the puffin head, it will show that way. That's how it's gonna be. And these two will give you a picture, which is a two chamber, which is a cine. So the problem is on this computer, I cannot play the images that I, I got. I can't get the videos on there. I couldn't, I tried to do everything I could, but I'm not so much savvy computer wise. So next time I'll try to do better and ask somebody to help me and get it done. So this image that you get here is a two chamber this two chamber here. So this two chamber is actually a playing image. You can actually play through and see the heart contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. So you can actually measure and look at the, the muscles of the heart, the myocardium. So from there, you can actually look at the myocardium here and how it is, whether it is thickened or it's thinning or if there's any spots that you don't think that should be there, like a, a bright spot or a dark spot, which could be what they call a microvascular obstruction, or it could be a mass or anything like that. So we're looking at all those things. So we're looking at what they call regional war uh, abnormalities. So we're looking at this, when this plays, we have to look at how the, like the, the myocardium is contracting and relaxing contracting and relaxing. If it is sluggish, then we know there's a problem. Then we have a problem called regional war abnormality. So that should give us an indication of what is going on in that area and then we can focus on it. So we use the four chamber as we can go down here and we use a puffing head, which is basically this one, which is a series of pictures as well. If I was able to play it, I was going to play it so that we can show you that from this image, we can actually get a mini image like that. So this image here is what we call the mushroom. So we just call it that way because if you look in here, me in the here in the middle, it looks like a mushroom turned upside down. So basically, we're not trying to get a three chamber of the heart to try to show the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and then the atria. We need to show. We need to go through this mushroom. So as you can see on the mushroom. This is the mushroom. So we have to go through in the middle and try to orient that through the apex and through the atria in the middle to just get a picture like that, which will give us uh, the left ventricular outflow tracking there, right ventricle here, and the right atrium there. So this is a three chamber. So 
In the heart, we're able to define the four chamber, we're able to define the two chamber, and we're now able to define the three chamber, which I've just shown you. So this is the right, left ventricle outflow, and this is the right atrium, and this is the right ventricle. So you've got three chambers being shown there. So the reason why we're looking at that is we're trying to look at this valve here in the middle. Can you see that black thing there where the arrow is? That is a valve. So we're looking at that one there to see what is going on there. So that actually is the aortic valve. So what we do is we're going to look at that and assess whether that valve is opening and closing normally. And if there's any flapping, then we know. If there's any movement or anything that shouldn't be there or it's not moving properly, it may result in other issues in the heart. So when they talk about valvular disease, they're talking about things like that. So we're looking at the valve to see how functional it is. This is why MR is better because it shows the function, it shows the anatomy, and it also shows the uh, tissue characterization. So as you look at that, you realize that if there was a problem on the valve, sorry, if there was a problem on the valve here, we will be able to detect. If it's not closing properly, we'll be able to detect. And we'll do some scans to show, to just go through that area, like lines drawn across the valve to just see how it's working and how it's opening. So on that, we'll be able to see it opening and closing and then be able to tell whether that is actually a two leaflet valve or a tri leaflet valve. So from there on, we'll go to this one. So basically using the three chamber that I showed you earlier, we can get what we call the left ventricular outflow tracking, uh, which is actually more of a corona image, but yeah, it is actually a line drawn just across through the, this picture here, oh, come on. Yeah, just this picture here. So you can see this is a, you know, left ventricle there going like an aortic root there coming. And then, the, you know, and the, 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 the ventricles there and the atria there. And this is the root, this is the root actually of the, the aorta. And you've got the, the valve there. And this is what they call the ST junction or the sinotubular, sinotubular junction. So that is where the valve is. So you just cut that cross that line in, uh, through that line to get a picture like this, which will give you the left ventricular outflow tracking. So this is the left ventricle here, and this is how the body, how uh, the heart exp uh, you know, expounds or releases the blood from the left ventricle in, you know, into the aorta there. So this is the valve, which is actually the aortic valve, as you can see, that dark line there is the aortic valve. So to look at the valve and to look for valvular disease, this is how we come to the three chamber again, which I showed you earlier, and the left ventricular outflow tracking uh, coronal image, you go through there, you just get some other, some departments use three slices. We only use one, one slice by the cine because to be able to play and be able to look through the the valve and these two should give you a picture which is right in the corner which is this one so this is actually telling you if you look at that in the middle here if you can see from this picture cutting through there and this picture cutting through there which is basically a three chamber cutting through the sinotubular junction and through the valve and the LVOT, which is left ventricular astral tracking, you go through the valve there, you get an image like that, which gives you this in the center. If you look at that, it's actually showing almost like a Mercedes Benz sign. So that to us in this patient differentiates and tells us that this patient has what you call a trileaflet aortic valve, because we can see three clasps of the, of the valve. And the, yeah, so you can see all these, one there, one there, and the other. So it actually opens like a triangular or Y shape there. So basically, on the next image, if I was to play that one, you will see that it will actually open into like a triangle to show that the valve is patent. So by doing that, we've resolved the issue of at least the aortic valve there, that indeed there's no aortic issues there. And we can use 
that image there, this image that when you play it as a scene, and that image to see the opening of the valve there, to see the opening of the art valve there, and to see the opening of the art valve there as well. So elegant enhance, elegant enhancement means basically that we do scan, uh, we give contrast after we've done some bits there, we do give contrast and we do some scans initially at about 30 seconds after the scan. This is just to show you how they look like. So this is an early guard two chamber. So you've got the vent ventricles down here and the artery, the, uh, the atrium there, which is two, 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 two chambers, the ventricle and the atrium, atrium there. And you've got a four chamber, which looks like that. So first you've got the atria there and the ventricles dot two there. And the three chamber, which is basically the ventricle there, the outflow and the right atrium there. So we do get the pictures. They look very bright, except if you notice that my picture here, I was just trying to show you that we've got, if this is how the three chamber looks like, but actually there's no contrast in there. These have contrast. So once we've done that, we now, because we don't want to waste time in MR, because time is very, very important in MR and is of, of essence, we end up, we don't want to waste time and lose time. So what we do is we end up using the time that we've given to trust, because there are some sequences in MRI that are not affected by, by contrast. So for instance, if I'm doing a short axis cine, that won't be affected by contrast. If there's contrast, it will still give me the pictures that won't take away anything from the diagnostic artifact uh, aspect of it or, uh, or functional aspect of it at all. So this is how we plan. If you look down here where my arrow is on the two chamber under the elegant enhancement, you find that we've got these green lines here. This is how we plan it from the apex there going towards the base and just going just a little bit beyond there before the base. And this is how on the four chamber it looks like. So we've got the apex there, the base there, but we cover from the apex just to go beyond these valves here. That, that is it, to that divides the ventricles from the atria to just cover them so we can get a picture like that. So the picture won't be just a single image like that. As I said, it's a cine. So a cine basically it's like a movie. So it has a, a series of pictures that begin, you can play them and you can actually play them and it will play all the way through from from there to where to there to show you if there's any valve obstruction there or the other side and to just show the anatomy and also show you the myocardium in that area in the septum as well as on the side here on the bottom bit of it there so that is how we plan for uh cardiac imaging so uh from that that point we need to start talking about what we call the meeting for but uh that is just basically basic planning and this is not the exhaustion of basic planning the other things that i haven't talked about here i've just talked about the real really basic basic stuff of planning so so we came up this morning uh this evening to talk to talk about a few things that we wanted to highlight and they wanted to talk about cardiomyopathy so what is cardiomyopathy? So cardiomyopathy basically is a disease of the heart muscle that makes it harder for the heart to pump blood to the rest of the body. So basically what it is, is cardiomyopathy is a, for, you know, is a disease that actually attacks the heart muscle, the myocardium. So if you look at the word itself, cardiomyopathy, cardio is the heart, myo is the muscle, and pathy is pathology. So this word is divided into three. So talking about cardiac, the muscle, and the pathology. So it's the pathology of the heart muscle, basically. And this pathology of the heart muscle makes it impossible or really hard for the heart to pump the blood to the rest of the body. So we'll talk about it and the types of cardiomyopathy. So, what are the types of cardiomyopathy? Cardiomyopathy basically is a generic term that they use for to just try to talk about pathology of the heart muscle. So it is quite, uh, these are the main types, but they quite they can be quite a few. Like, uh, you know, some of it is done, uh, caused by uh, uh, diabetes as well as high blood pressure, but then the others that are actually we know, like in this case, we're talking about the types that we know are uh, quite co prominent. So these are dilated cardiomyopathy, 
or Hokam DCM or Hokam, which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or some of them call it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And then we have the restricted cardiomyopathy. And then we have what they call arthmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So these are the four main types of cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy, also sometimes called as idiopathic cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restricted cardiomyopathy, arthmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So what is dilated cardiomyopathy? So when you're talking about a dilated cardiomyopathy, you're talking about the, uh, the inability of the heart to uh, heart chambers, particularly the left ventricle, you know, when they become enlarged and cannot effectively pump blood out of the heart. So in this case, they're saying left or the right ventricle dilatation and failure in the absence of coronary artery disease. So coronary artery disease is a disease that affects the arteries when the arteries get clogged up and they narrow or stenose or harden such that blood cannot be fused through. So if there's that absence of coronary artery disease, then this problem can be caused by other things. But if there is an absence of coronary artery disease, hypertension, valvular disease, or any congenital heart malformation, then this one, because of the failure of you know, uh, the failure, uh, the failure of the heart to pump the blood out of the system, and also the dilatation of the ventricle, that may, renders it to be called a dilated cardiomyopathy because the ventricle is dilated and the heart is failing to pump the pressure to pump, pump the blood out of the, the body because it can't exert enough pressure because there's a thickening of the muscle and there's pathology in the muscle. So normally patients usually present with shortness of breath, signs of congestion in an identical way to heart failure. And indeed, there are many causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. Friend, I know people like enjoying a drink, but we have to be aware that indeed drink, we have to not abuse it, but to take it in moderation. So some of the causes of dilated cardiomyopathy are alcohol abuse. Some of it lands in the family. Indeed, myocarditis, which is the inflammation of the myocardium, and the post or chemotherapy. You know, uh, some of those people who had cancer and they've been exposed to radiation to try to treat the cancer and they try to use chemotherapy as well, like it drugs with like uh, get examples of drugs like adriamycin or doxorubicin. They do cause uh, cardiomyopathy dilated. So indeed, things like hemochromatosis, thyrotoxicosis, and thiamine deficiency. So this is how a dilated cardiomyopathy appears. So this is the normal heart on the left side of the screen, which shows the heart, the vessels, and the muscles very nice and uh, nice and thick nicely, but also very, very in shape. When you talk about the other picture on the right side of the screen, you realize that this is actually a very good example of how a dilated cardiomyopathy actually operates and how it looks like. When you look at that, the vessels here, the muscle in, in a, you know, the septum is thickened, but you realize that the muscle on the inside of the left ventricle actually is thinning. Because it's thinning, it starts now bulging out and it becomes almost like a globe instead of this like a triangular shape, it more goes like oval oblong shape. So this is actually what dilated cardiomyopathy looks like from a picture. So we're going to talk about uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Others call it hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So that one is actually a Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is a diffuse or segmental left ventricle hypertrophy with a non-dilated or non-hyperdynamic chamber. So basically, in this sense, you know, we are talking about something that comes out from different types of things. So we are talking about hypertrophy. Hypertrophy basically is just hyper is way higher. And trophy some comes to, to do with you know uh, something going wrong. So if there's any diffuse or segment or basically if there's a part of the heart or the left ventricle, the muscle, a part of it is actually hypertrophized, it's like thickened or hardened or stretched. 
then causes what they call hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this happens in the absence of another cardiac or systematic disease capable of producing the same magnitude of hypertrophy that is evident. So sometimes this is caused by mutations of the genes, particularly the genes that encode the cardiac sarcomia proteins. So my, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy actually is characterized by myocardial hypertrophy affecting the intraventricular septum. Remember I showed you from the picture. So basically talking about this here, the septum here, this is the intra, intra ventricular septum because this is between the ventricles here. So this is where it is. So it affects that as well. So, and that is the characteristic of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So how does it look like? It does look like here. So when you look on the left side of the screen, you realize that this is a normal heart. As you can see, very nice triangular shape of the ventricle there nicely. And then here, it changes because it's, you know, they talked about the intraventricular septum thickening. So as you can see in this picture here, you realize that the interventricular septum here actually is thickened, but as well as the, the wall of the ventricle on the side, which is all thickened. So because of that thickening, there is less space for the, uh, for the blood to fill in there. So eventually you end up not having enough blood to squirt through to the aorta, the rest of the body. So the body suffers so because the, 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 the ventricle, the left ventricle is hypertrophized. So there is a left ventricular hypertrophy here when you look at the thickening of the muscle and the interventricular septum. So that leads to uh, problems in the fact that the body or the heart cannot get enough blood in the ventricle to pump it out the rest of the body and the body suffers, particularly the peripheral aspects of the body like the toes and the fingers, they will suffer. So when you talk about phenotypes, so basically these are the types of, these are the types of Hockam. This is just the types of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So we did talk about the hypertrophy of the, uh, of the, the, of the, uh, the ventricular wall. So when you look at this diagram, which is diagram A, this is for the normal heart. This is a normal heart. As you can see, the left ventricle wall is thicker. The septum is slightly thicker, but it's OK. When you look at the uh, diagram B, which is actually a septal hyper-H uh, outcome or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it is septal because when you look at that, the septum in the middle, as you can see here, if you can follow the arrow, it is very thicker. And it's not just thicker, there is, it is also causing an obstruction here in the left ventricle outflows tracking there. There's squeezing of that area, that space that's smaller as compared to the normal heart. So this is actually what they call asymmetrical septal uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with left ventricular outflow tracking obstruction because this is obstructed. When you look at the type phenotype C of Hockam or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is that you look at this one and you realize that the septum is thicker, the muscle is thicker. So this is also asymmetrical because it's not symmetry, it is different. So it is, this one is called uh, asymmetrical septal hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with preserved or non-obstruction of the LVOT or the left ventricular outflow tracking, which is basically, I'll show you if I can get my mouse working, I can't see it. Okay, I can see it now. So when you look at that, this is thickened here, it's thickened here. So it is asymmetry, asymmetrical because it's not in portion, but this is asymmetrical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy of the septum, but also with no non-obstructed LVOT here, which is this left ventricular outflow tracking. This one is not obstructed as compared to this one. 
So the difference between the two is this is an obstructed, this is obstructed. When you look at the phenotype D, this is actually an apical holcom. So because of the apex here, the whole apex is actually thickened and part of the interventricular septum is thickened. So this gets thicker. So basically, this makes the heart makes it harder for the heart to pump because the heart muscle has to be elastic for it to pump. So if this thickens or hardens or stretches, it becomes difficult to get that power and the pressure to get the blood to all parts of the body. So when you look at diagram C here, uh, uh, diagram E here. Diagram E is, is what you call a symmetrical hokam. So if you look at the way it's looking on the picture here, my mouse, where is my mouse? If you look at the diagram E here, the whole of this wall, the septum and the left ventricle is thickened and it is very symmetrical all around it. So this is why they call it symmetrical hyper, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. When you look at the diagram F here as a phenotype F, this is what they call mid ventricular because if you look at the way it's looking like, you realize that the ventricles are actually mid ventricle are actually thicker than the rest of the, the place. So when you look at that, that is thicker there and that's thicker there. So this is called the intraventricular or the mid ventricular because it's in the middle of the ventricles, mid ventricular hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The phenotype G there will give us what we call a mass like because when you look at the left, ventricle muscle there, the myocardium, there is something like a bow there. So it's more like a mass-like. So that is defined as a mass-like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And when you look at the H there, it is what they call the non-contiguous because it's got like a lot of bows around the left ventricle area there, the muscle there. It is called the non-contiguous hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So patients in, with all these can present at any age with chest pain, dyspnea, palpitations, and syncope. And the thing is that you realize that the most important complication of cardiomyopathy is actually sudden death. So if you remember in the beginning of the program, I did mention about the statistics in Zambia, much as they haven't really specifically said patients have died from cardiomyopathy, because there's no categorization. All they say is congenital, uh, they, they just say uh, CHD. So coronary heart diseases. So the way our statistics are done to an extent hasn't been very straightforward. We needed to classify disease by, by, by name and by, by, by its uh, you know, properties that may say, or oh, it's characteristics of a disease, and then identify those diseases. If it's COVID, if it's COVID, uh, COVID uh, uh, Delta variant, so many people died with COVID var uh, Delta variant. So it's the same in this case. So we haven't been, as a country, be able to uh, categorize diseases uh, as they should be. So uh, according to statistics, we just say coronary heart diseases. So coronary heart disease may mean uh, uh, scarred may mean uh, heart failure with preserved ventricular eject uh, 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 ejection fraction, uh, you know, uh, heart failure with the, you know, reduced ejection fraction. It could be uh, sarcoid, it could be amyloid, it could be Fabris, any other disease, but we've just put them suddenly in one port called coronary heart diseases. So when you look at the the, our statistics in the country, we realize that there are so many people who are dying of ca uh, cardiac problems, and they may not even put to say this is the exact cardiac problem that the patient has died of. They'll just say uh, maybe heart attack or uh, coronary heart disease, but not necessarily that it could be 
uh, cardiomyopathy. So they have to be specific in the way they do things. So when I talk about you know sudden death being the most important uh, complication is that most of our people are dying because we are not treating them because there is no access to to health in terms of uh, diagnostics and uh, other things like MRCT or not much is done in that area to look at what the problems are and not enough qualified staff like cardiologists or imaging cardiologists to help us make the diagnosis and then look at the treatment options that are available. So when you look at that, this sudden death normally arises from what they call a non-sustainable ventricular you know, tachycardia. So sometimes people go into what they call a VT, when you talk about getting, they go into VT, and that VT is just too much that somebody cannot sustain that VT, and eventually they just drop dead. And they just say, oh, he just died. Oh, how did he die? He just dropped and died. So we have to be very careful as to what we do. And this is very, very important. That's why I brought the statistics in to try to highlight the fact that we need to do much more uh, as a country. We need to do much more as the Ministry of Health to try and help. We need to do much more as a society, you know, regulatory society of Zambia, that indeed we look into this thing and indeed look at getting professionals to come and help us and train our staff to do things like this, to be able to tell what the problems are and see how best we can treat, because some of the diseases and conditions can be prevented, you know? And also the other issues that may arise or complications are thromboembolism, infective endocarditis and conducting system disease. So people talk about having palpitations, but if we go in detail, we we'll look at some, some of the so-called heart palpitations are not necessarily heart palpitations. They are probably what they call arrhythmias. So because of somebody suffering from a cardiomyopathy uh, and then it attacks the conduction system of the body that conducts the electricity of the heart to make it beat, the heart or the system will be misfiring, sending signals when they shouldn't send signals. And those signals will end up resulting in the, resulting in the heart running very fast. And if we cannot control that, we end up having what they call a non-sustainable ventricular tachycardia, which ends up in sudden death, as I said. So the other form of cardiomyopathy is what they call a restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is actually a heart, uh, you know, it's well. So because the heart is made, the mass of the heart is made to be elastic, to be able to squeeze and relax, or to, yeah, to, to, to squeeze and relax, the muscles become very stiff that cannot squeeze effectively and cannot relax effectively because they are not flexible. So, it becomes a problem because now the heart cannot squeeze as it should and cannot expand to fill the blood within so that indeed you can get enough blood to pump out uh, of the body uh, of the heart to go somewhere else. So when you look at those things, we realize that that is actually what is termed as a restricted, a restrictive cardiomyopathy. The heart muscle is stiff, less flexible, such that the heart cannot expand and relax to fill with blood between heartbeats so that indeed the heart can squeeze and pump the blood to the rest of the body. But this is one of the least common cardiomyopathies and normally affects older people. The problem is that when we have restrictive cardiomyopathy, some people have had surgery. I would classify it, or can I give an example of something like when the precardium as well of the heart stiffens or becomes less flexible. The precardium is a sheet of muscle that sits outside the heart where the, yeah, where the fluid is to help us cushion the heart. So sometimes you realize that that can harden as well. It becomes like a leather. So it's just like you've got a ball and the tube inside the ball and the, 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 the outside of the ball, the skin of the ball is very leather-like and it's very firm. And you're trying to pump the tube inside. You can only pump the tube to an extent because it is restricted as to how far it can go. 
that is exactly what happens in this restrictive cardiomyopathy. party. So what they have to do is they have to go and peel off the pericardium, which can be actually very, very dangerous to try to treat this surgically. But this is quite common in older people, but it can occur in any other age. So restricted cardiomyopathy patients do present with predominantly right-sided heart failure, and also what they call the raised, you know, jugular venous pressure, and also they may have hepatomegaly. So sometimes uh, people, are uh, folks from ultrasound, they may see hepatomegaly and they're just wondering what's happening. It could be that uh, there's, there is an issue with the cardiac problem. You know, they may have a normal heart size, but also the classic signs are that there is what they call a very loud S3 and S4. So the common causes of these are hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, and any malignancy or glycogen storage disease. Sometimes sclerodoma and endomyocardial fibrosis. So the last type of cardiomyopathy I want to talk about is what they call arrhythmogenic ventric right ventricular dysplasia. This is a very rare type where the muscle of the lower right heart chamber, which is the right ventricle, not the left, the right ventricle this time is replaced by scar tissue leading to a heart rhythm problems. Remember, I did talk about people going into non-sustainable ventricular tachycardia. This can be the problem. So if somebody has arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, it may result into heart rhythm problems. So people who have this problem, they end up manifesting with what we call rhythmic problems. So people do have arrhythmias. Basically, we all do have arrhythmias. We may have about 1%, 1 to 10% of arrhythmias in the day as the heart beats. But with people with uh, arrhythmic problems or arrhythm cardiac arrhythmias, it is much more worse. Instead of having maybe one in every 100 beats, they may have like maybe 80 in 100 beats. So basically, that is becoming a problem where their heart races very fast because it cannot be controlled. And the cause of this is mostly genetic mutations. So I want us to show uh, examples of cardiomyopathy here. So as you can see from the pictures here, on the A side, the picture A here, we can see the, the ventricles and the atrium there. And we can see that there is the, no, the ventricle, the left ventricle and the right ventricle there, and the septum there. You can see that there's this arrow there. There's what you call, if you look at the arrow, there's something that's appearing a bit white there. That is what you call uh, 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 fibrosis there. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, quite, it's quite common because the, the heart works very hard. So that can be fibrotic, but that is also, when you see that, it gives you an idea of what's happening. But when you look at the, the septum there, it is thicker than the walls outside here. So that tells us that there is a chance that this septum has a problem. But also when you look at the B picture here, we see that the septum is actually nice shape and nice, nice length and the depth, but you see a bit of thickening outwards there in the superior inferolateral myocardium and the inferolateral myocardium here in the bottom there. So you see that those areas there, they are thicker. So that is actually a sign that there is uh, cardiomyopathy in the heart. So when you're looking at the cardiac uh, MRI and you're looking at the short axis image like this or a cine, you're going to see things like that showing that. If you look at A here, you see that there's a thinning of the muscle there, but there is a thickening of the muscle, which actually corresponds to what I was talking about earlier in about the phenotypes of Holcomb and stuff like that. So. This is just an example. Another example here is when you look at that picture, another short axis image, which showing that the left ventricle there and the right ventricle here. If you see the walls here look all right, a little bit of thinning there, but okay. And the thinning, thin septum until you get the top there, which is actually the superior, you know, superior lateral area there. It's very thickened as demonstrated by the arrow there. So that is also one of the telltale signs of uh, cardiomyopathies. When you look on this the picture, this side, which is actually a three chamber image, can you see the thickness of the muscle there at the top? 
And can you see the thinning there? This is the tubular junction here. And you can see the valve, that is the aortic valve there. But as you can see, there's a narrowing of this space here. As there is narrowing this space there, it leads to a condition called SAM, which is basically a systolic anterior maltral valve uh, uh, problem uh, uh, motion. So that sum is not a very good thing because if there's motion there, because it will cause this valve here. Where is it? Oh, where is it? Oh, come on. It will cause this valve here uh, not to open very nicely. It will probably prolapse. And when that prolapses, it will be like bellowing down here. And if it bellows down here, instead of opening nicely, it can't open nicely. It bellows like that. It will allow what you call regurgitation to occur. So this will actually give us a rise into a condition called aortic regurgitation, which is actually a valvular disease. So the valves are incompetent. They cannot work properly because there is this thickening of the muscle here at the top. So it's putting pressure on the left ventricular artery, tracking that into the aorta. And it's making it narrower there as it narrows that. So blood is pushing really hard. So eventually pushing these uh, uh, valves there and they become weaker as time goes on and then start bellowing and resulting in a condition called SAM, which is systolic anterior motion. So some, if we have some, then it also leads to other problems. Once you have the aortic regurgitation there, the chances that there will be regurgitation now, what you call MR regurgitation. So the mitral valve also will start now leaking and then it will end up having another problem. So this problem here with uh, aortic valve leaking uh, and bellowing blood instead of going in one direction out of the ventricle as it should, as it should, it's not going out, it's coming back and you know, flowing back, backwards, instead of flowing that way. Because blood in, the, in there should flow one direction. So if you see, there is that black arrow showing that narrowing there, but also it is showing that if this is narrowed and this is weaker, this blood that goes there, some of it will go, most of them will come back and that will be aortic regurgitation and it will affect the mitral valve here as well and it will be like bellowing as well and there'll be mitral valve regurgitation. So those are the problems that we may find. So this also came from the fact that there is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy there in that area there, the thickening of the muscle, hence uh, reducing the space, therefore, blood to flow and also weakening that valve, weakening that valve and ending up with valvular disease. So that's very, very important to note that and see what they can do. Because if they find this problem and they know that they can deal with it, they can go and change this valve, put a mechanical valve there, put another mechanical valve there, and the patient won't have so much problem. They can treat this uh, with drugs and the medications. So this is uh, another one, a picture of showing apical uh, cardiomyopathy. So if you look at the AP, uh, apex there of the heart, can you see how the muscle looks like there? It's just not stranding, but it's actually very thin muscle there. And then there's something inside here and a bit there. And you can see the septum is quite nice and thin, but this is apical, uh, it's an example of apical cardiomyopathy. So these are some of the patterns that we do have for uh, how cardiomyopathies are exhibited uh, post-contrast uh, scans, in post-contrast scans. So when you look at the pictures there, these are the characteristic patterns of late enhancement in specific cardiomyopathies. So when you look at these pictures here, you've got a there and you've got that bit there. This is where the contrast will sit because if there is any uh, cardiomyopathy, contrast tend to stick. So it will stick and it will give us this picture. So this is the septum there and we've got a bit of the inferior part of the septum there is actually white there. And this is thinning of the, of the other the side of the muscle of the ventricle. So this one is actually a type called ischemic cardiomyopathy because this has resulted from the result of blood vessels narrowing and then uh, affecting the blood supply of 
uh, that muscle area there and causing it to actually die or necrotize. And then look at B, you can see it nicely in the septum, very nice, narrow, wide picture there. Uh, and that is what they call idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. This is how it sort of looks like uh, if we were to draw pictures. As you can see here in this picture here, you can see the left ventricle there, the right ventricle there, and this is septum. And then you can see it coming down all the way like that as shown in this picture here. So whilst in here, you can see that the bottom bit of the uh, interventricular septum, the inferior aspect of it, is not being supplied and there's necrosis of the muscle there. As you can see from here, there's no blackening of the muscle because the muscle should look very black and now because when we're doing the delayed scans, we do what we call a T1, a TI scout, which is basically uh, a picture that we do to look at the heart muscle to see the nulling point of the heart muscle. And once we understand the figure at which it is nulling, basically if it's moving from being bright into gray into black and into sub gray. So when it's getting darker, that is the nulling point. So we look at the figure, which is what you call the contrast or the TI number, which is basically invention time. So we put that invention time, in, we put it in the protocol to do these pictures. And this is why you can see that here around the, 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 the muscle here, it is nulling very nicely, but here it is patchy and it's very bright. So because there is indeed ischemia there, there's no blood supply there. So that muscle here is dead basically. As we saw on this one, which is actually the, the idiopathic diagramopathy, we've seen that the left ventricle, if you look at the walls, it's very black and dark there, and this is dark, but you have a very patchy enhancement in the middle there, which is actually showing us that there is something that's not right there. But also when you look at the diagram C, we do have a, this is actually a proper hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this one. You can tell that if there's patchy light enhancement, there's in enhancement there, there's black there's enhancement there, black enhancement there, black. So it's patchy enhancement. This is a classic picture of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on the C diagram. If you look on the, the diagram, diagram here next to the picture, you realize how it looks like. You can't really distinguish where the, the muscle is and where the, the, you know, the muscle and the, where the ventricles are properly because it is all mishmashy because of that patchy enhancement that you can see in all those areas, hence that picture there. So when you look at this D picture here, this D is actually not uh, uh, that this is actually an inflammatory process, which is myocarditis. When you look at that, that picture there, let me just have a look. Oh, where is that? Okay. So when you look at that picture there, that is the uh, myocarditis. You look at the, the myocardium is is there, there's no, it just looks very dead there and very dead there. So this is just the enhancement of contrast nicely there because it's an inflammatory process. As inflammation occurs, contrast does stick to an inflammatory areas. So when you look at this picture, it's the same picture to the D there. This is how enhancement is both sides there. And then look at picture E, you realize that this is actually a sarcoid. Sarcoidosis is quite, uh, quite tricky. And you can tell that this is how it looks like. So there is a very dense epicardial zone that is actually there. And then also that there's a lot of enhancement there and there, but all along it's very dark, dark, nice dark and denied pattern of the myocardium. As you can see from here, this side is very dark and nicely. We, we, when you see this black, we, we, we want to, we, we feel good because it's nice. That one is nice, but then you see this bit and that bit that you know that there's infiltration process taking place there. On the F bit there, it's actually what they call amyloidosis. 
So there is a, lot, a proper diffuse of enhancement around the area. And you can see it's much more like almost in the endo myocardium there. It's, and then also some of it partly outside, but mostly inside. So those are some of the pictures I can show you to just show the types of cardiomyopathies and how they show on late gadolinium imaging. So in 2009, they do, the, the, the Congress in America brought up what they call the Lewis criteria in inflammatory cardiac diseases. So basically what this consensus uh, came about, uh, came to do was to, to recommend that the co combination of different ca uh, cardiovascular magnetic resonance techniques in patients with saturated inflammation, they use this as a criteria. So those patients who are uh, exhibiting signs or suspected of having inflammatory diseases, they said they should come up with a plan to say, how do we look at these people? So these are the guys that they came up with a plan that indeed two T2 weighted spin echoes will be used in scanning patients to determine myocardial edema. So if there's any swelling of the myocardium, you will see it on T2 weighted spin echo sequences. But also they said, if you want to look for hyperemia, hyperemia basically is just basically the, uh, the, uh, a huge flow of blood, or I would say extensive flow of blood in those vessels, you will see it in T1 weighted spin echo images. But if you want to see any necrosis or dead tissue, you only see in late gadolinium enhancement pictures, as you saw from the previous slides. So the Lake Lewis criteria enabled detection of focal or diffuse inflammatory reaction using a semi-quantitative approach. So basically what I'm saying is they are using the eye. So it's a naked eye. It's all analysis was visual, looking at different types of tissues and then visually saying this could be, this could be hyperemia, this could be myocardial edema, this could be necrosis, just using the eye. So the problem is that T1 weighted spin echo frequent uh, free breathing images are normally done when the patients cannot hold their breath and normally they are useless. They are very, very difficult to interpret because the diagnostic quality is very, very limited because the patient is breathing and trying to scan. You can't really analyze tissue in that you know, moving images. But also the T2 weighted sequences of uh, spin echo also have got very low you know, signal to noise ratio. So the pictures tend to be grainy. They're not very resolute for us to be able to tell and look at the tissue to see that this is actually uh, edema, this is hyperemia, this is necrosis. So conventional MR indeed relied on, you know, image signal intensities to highlight and label areas deemed abnormal compared to areas deemed normal. So basically it was just visual assessment. So if my eye sees it this way, your eye may see it different. So this is why it was very difficult to actually come up with a proper tool. So this is why after the cine, which we talked about the sinus images and the late gadolinium enhancement and the provision imaging as in sometimes stress, and parametric mappings are actually regarded as the fourth era of the myocardial, you know, cardiovascular magnetic resonance development. So basically what this has done is to add a second or a fourth dimension to what we've been doing. The seniors alone will do, will do tell us about anatomy. They will tell us about the function in terms of regional war uh, motion abnormalities. The left guards will tell us for any enhancements, uh, to tell us whether it's sarcoid, it's amyloid, or it's just a fibrosis. Indeed, the previous scanning also would tell us that whether there is any narrowing of the vessels uh, or there's indeed nothing of that sort. But parametric mappings, the ones that I'm going to talk about, are actually widely regarded as the fourth era of the myocardial cardiovascular magnetic resonance development. Because in contrast to the, con the conventional CMR tissue characterization techniques, which were visual, 
these now rely on relative variations in image intensities. You know, sorry to say, in contrast to the conventional CMR tissue design, which relied on visual, you know, uh, visual appreciation to look at the image intensities to highlight any abnormal tissues. Parametric T1 mappings provides a direct visualization of tissue MR properties such as T1, T2, T2 star in absolute denominations into milliseconds. So basically they're talking about this is that these mappings are actually very much quanti quantifiable. You can quantify these and you can actually reproduce this quantification at a later stage as compared to a visual. Because when you look at the conventional way of looking at tissue characteristics and relying on relative variations in image intensities to, net, to note any abnormalities, if this radiologist looks at them and sees this and thinks it is this, and this one sees it differently, you cannot reproduce that. But with parametric provisions and mappings, you get absolutes, T1, T2, T2 star. So, what are these parametric mappings then? Parametric mappings are actually pixel-wise map of magnetic relaxation parameters. So what we're talking about is that we're looking at the picture pixel by pixel and looking at their relaxation parameters. Because remember, T1 and T2 have different relaxation times. So we're looking at those relaxation times in T1 and T2 to use a map and look at the pixels because that is what parametric uh, map mappings represent. They give us a pixel-wise parametric map, which brings in spatial information for a complete assessment of their myocardium. So this is very technical, but basically they're looking at pixel by pixel. So if they look at that, it is easier to quantify that and be able to reproduce that than a different eye look at a different eye. Because when you look at the visual aspect of analysis, it is subjective. This one may say this, this one may say that, another one may say something different. But with this parametric mappings, you actually talking about absolutes. So if the value was one millisecond, the next time they do, it has to be one millisecond if there was no disease. If there was this, it was like 10 milliseconds, it has to be 10 milliseconds or it's reducing or growing. They are absolute numbers. So you can actually say this is absolute. So what these parametric mappings have done is that they have expanded the potential of cardiovascular MR imaging to allow us quantify the myocardial tissue specifically like sometimes on the absolute scale. And this myocardial composition can be altered in various disease states. So if somebody has fibrosis, it will be different. If somebody had amyloid, it will be different. If somebody had cardiomyopathy, like a, a, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it will be different. If somebody had an inflammatory process, like myocarditis, it will be different. So using parametric terms, the parametric mappings, we can actually quantify that. So what does T1 maps do? T1 maps actually measure the T1 reduction time of both the pre and the post contrast administration images that are acquired and will be used to calculate the extracellular volume fraction. So when they use the T1 maps, I'll show you an example of T1 map as we go down. Don't worry about it. So the T1 map is essentially a measure of the T1 relaxation time in both the images that we've acquired without contrast and the images that we acquire, we acquire with contrast. And we use those to actually calculate what they call the extracellular volume fraction. So acute myocardial damage or fibrosis will lead to elevated T1 natives. So what I'm talking about is if you put a region of interest in the tissue that you're looking at, you're characterizing, the T1 native will give you a number and to give you what they call a standard deviation, which is either plus two or plus four, somewhere around that, plus or minus two or plus or minus four. And you do the same to the post-contrast 
images done at the same point that you did earlier, then you get the number as well. So you can now subtract the, the values and it will give you what we call the extracellular volume fraction, which is the ECV fraction. So parametric uh, mappings have been introduced to distinguish the pattern of inflammation from focal injury to a diffuse reaction. It also helps to diagnose non-focal disease states. Parametric mappings also allow for longitudinal disease monitoring. So basically, when we have a patient who has presented with this disease, we've imaged them today and we give them treatment, we send them away. When they come back three months, we do the same scans and see and compare the two. Because this can be repetitive, this can be reproduced, we'll be able to tell the progression or be able to tell the decrease in the disease or how good things are going. So it helps us to evaluate what they call therapeutic responses. So if they've been treated, we can check them how they were before, we can check them how they are today, we can check them how they will be tomorrow and compare the three and make a decision to say, oh, they are improving or they're not improving, we need to change medication and things like that. It also helps in risk stratification and also differentiation of etiology because every type of disease or different types of disease or uh, infiltrations or problems, cardiac problems, they do have a difference in T1 times. So because of that, we're able to differentiate or oh, this T1 time is this, so it could be uh, uh, myocarditis, could be you know, uh, amyloid, it could be sarcoid, it could be fabris and things like that. So it will help us differentiate focal from diffuse alterations, which were not accessible before with late gadolinium enhancement. When you look at the late gadolinium enhancement, sometimes you give contrast and it perfuses and it leaves, it stays there. It is very difficult to tell what is sarcoid, what is uh, amyloid and what is just inflammation sometimes. It is quite difficult, but with T1 mappings, we have absolutes basically, and it will tell us and will give us that differentiation aspect to differentiate the different types of you know alterations in the tissue, be it focal from a diffuse one. Hence, why they are using a, a biomarker to support diagnostic, therapeutic, and progression decision making in ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. When you talk about ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, we're talking about one that has got issues with uh, blood supply, which is ischemia, and then the one that is non-related to blood supply. Those types of cardiomyopathies, we are able to use this parametric mapping as a marker to support their diagnostic aspect of it, the therapeutic and decision-making for the treatments of the patient. So, this is why T1 mappings are the way forward because they are providing a direct quantification and a comparison within individual cells and be able to detect any diffuse disease, which is not uh, evident on conventional cardiovascular MR imaging. And this is why we are, they are pushing for this because we know that Parametric mappings will allow us a direct quantitative comparison inter and within individuals, as well as detection of diffuse disease, not evident on conventional CMR imaging without the need for contrast agents. So that is a positive. The first positive is that we are getting an absolute value. The second one is that we are going to get direct quantification and compare what's happening between cells and tissues. And third, we are going to do that without the need for uh, contrast media, which eventually will, will end up helping the department in saving costs, saving money, saving patients from contrast reactions, and saving uh, you know, departments like in Europe from paying out huge sums of money for contrast agent reactions and for cause of uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. So the parametric uh, mappings also are useful for the evaluation of acute myocardial injury, suspected infiltration and heart failure of unclear etiology. 
people do come to the hospital and they say, oh, the heart is failing, but they don't know exactly what the, what the, what the cause is. Using parametric uh, mappings, we are able to quantify and we're able to indeed evaluate acute myocardial injury from and differentiate it from any suspected infiltration or any unclear etiology. We're able to use that to identify what is happening. So why are these parametric mappings important? They are very important because they add incremental diagnostic and prognostic value to conventional tissue characterization techniques, as in the, the old way of doing it with late gadolinium investment. And it helps in the evaluation of myocardial diseases and holds promise to offer contrast-free uh, protocols in the future. So I know most of the times when we're doing cardiac investigation, we're doing cardiacs with contrast. But as time goes on and as uh, developments continue to rise in this area, we we'll end up not using contrast media for most of the patients to be able to characterize their tissue and evaluate their diseases. Because also they are very important because they will give us a pixel by pixel representation of absolutely denominated numerical T1 or T2 properties, which will be expressed in milliseconds. So by this, I mean that when they look at these pictures, they will look at pictures pixel by pixel. And this is, the computer will look at pixel by pixel to try to give us a representation of an absolute numerical value in milliseconds to tell us that this is a T1 number and this is it. So, and this is a T2 number and their properties are around this. And then looking at the T1 and T2 like times, we'll be able to infer the tissue type the composition in the tissue and the composition of the surrounding areas and the environment. So post-contrast, post-contrast, T1 mappings. So I did talk about the calculation of the extracellular volume. So basically how we do this is we look at the myocardial tissue and the myocardial T1, which is usually longer, but it is shortened because of the admission of, of contrast media. So contrast media shortens T1 time. T1 time is usually longer, but it is shortened by contrast. So when we do these parametric mappings, we do one without contrast. Then we do in the same place we did the first one with contrast. And then we'll measure the differences between those two. So my cardio T1 is relatively longer, but it will be shortened by contrast. So if the value in the non-contrast T1 uh, parametric ma uh, mappings was say 10, the value in the post-contrast, it has to reduce because the T1 time is shortened by contrast. But also, the T1 factors can be uh, 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 affected by so many times other than contrast. It can be caused by poor renal function, you know, the age of the patient, and what they call hematocrit. So this is why post T1 contrast measurement by itself can change the dynamics with time, because as contrast is being cleared, it returns to where it was before, but it won't be the same, but it starts turning to where it was because there's no contrast in the tissue. But other factors is affecting it is that if the renal function is not working very well, then it, there will be a, a, a difficulty in extraditing or extradition of contrast or excretion of contrast from the human body from the tissue. Hence why the time will stay longer instead of getting shorter, to stay, to stay shorter for a long time, instead of getting longer and go back to the normal, relatively long time of T1s. So the preferred way of measuring this extracellular volume is using native T1. Native T1 is basically the pre-contrast T1 mappings that we do. We can look at that and then use the region of interest to see how the values are and then take away or add 
what they call the standard deviation and then come up with the figure and compare to the other one with contrast. So how do we calculate this extracellular volume? So the myocardio extracellular volume is estimated by measuring the pre and post contrast relaxation changes in the T1 time of the myocardium and blood. Then adjusting that ratio, then we get what we call the extracellular volume blood. So basically what we're saying here in short is that we take a T1 image, let me just show you. This is how we take them. Just, show, just follow me with the pictures, I'll show you. So we, we, we use the four chamber, two chamber and three chamber, and we draw a line or plan on the base of the ventricles. We get a picture like that. So you can see this is left ventricle, right ventricle, and we look at this area here, which is basically the myocardium. So we draw a circle using the, the tools that we have on the scanner around the areas there. We try, we try to draw there because that's where there is an insertion point and that is where fibrosis likely to take place first. We draw one there, we draw a few circles around and they give us values like maybe 10,000 or 1,000 and then you take away or add two maybe, or add, take away or add four, the standard deviation. So you get a value. So you draw another one in the middle of the, the ventricles and you get a picture like that. And then you look at that. So this is the right ventricle, left ventricle, but this is all myocardium. So we do another one, another picture like this at the apex of the heart and we get a picture like that. And this is the myocardium. So in doing that, we will do these pictures, pre-contrast, get these pictures, give contrast at the end, do in the same in the same area as the first one, which is the base, get a picture like that. And we don't have to do all of them. Normally we just get, for post-contrast, we just get the base and a four chamber like this in, in the mapping like that. And then we compare the resultant values here in the pre-contrast and the resultant values in the post-contrast. And then we can subtract those. And what to have is the extracellular volume. So the best way to describe this is a house. When you're building a house, you use blocks. When you have blocks, you use mortar or cement to put the bricks together to make a house. So, in T1, uh, pre-contrast or native T1, you use cement, put the blocks on there and it dries out and it looks fantastic. In T1, post-contrast scans, you get your bricks, you put cement there, you put water in there, and if there's nothing, no problems, it will look intact. But if there is a problem or if there is fibrosis, there is any issues like pathology, you do the T1 maps, it will give a value, like a beauty house, cement, it looks fantastic. Post contrast, you put your blocks, put cement and put water. Instead of the cement sticking to the bricks and looking nice, the cement starts coming out, like bulging through the, the blocks. So it looks very ugly. So that, is actually a very good description of what extracellular volume uh, uh, operates. So extracellular volume is just a that liquid that we've put in the contrast, which perfuses through and it starts coming out from the mortar, from the bricks. So the mortar comes out or the cement comes out, the bricks remains the same. In the native T1, it will all be neat, the brick and the cement will be neat. In the post-contrast T1, when there is a uh, pathology, the bricks will be there, but the motor will come out and you can't really see the bricks properly because it will be coming out. You see? So that is how, so that the thing that comes out is as a result of too much water or too much contrast in there coming out now, filling up the wrong bits, the, the, the pathology and filling up with contrast, hence coming out with that. So that motor that comes out or that cement that sticks out 
is actually what is what we can term as the extracellular volume uh, uh, fraction. So uh, I think I'll end here. There's so much to cover, but uh, bear with me. I can only talk about the native T1s, the, the way that they look at, maybe to talk about before you ask any questions, let me go back, is that the native T1 mappings, uh, they refer to a T1 mapping at rest before any contrast is given before any stress agent is given, before any exercise is induced. So what it represents is a composite signal from both the intracellular and the extracellular compartments. So basically it's talking about the, the brick and the mortar. So the each tissue type has a specific normal range of T1 values and deviations from each indicates disease or a change in physiology. So as I said, there, each tissue has different types of T1, T1 times. So if there is disease or there is pathology, there will be a deviation from the standard or from the normal. So native T1 mapping also, you know, characterizes, it is characterized by a relative narrow normal range of myocardial T1. So the range of net normal T1 is very narrow with a very small standard deviation. And this has been replicated in so many studies that have been done that they've come up with these values. I'm yet to get the values at the moment. Uh, I, I think I didn't look into that as much, but yeah. So those values will increase with a free water content in the tissue. And the T1 mappings is actually one of the best to use to detect any acute myocardial inflammation or edema and any chronic pathologies which may be in the myocardium. Because what they will do is if there's any pathology and the contrast goes in, it, it will expand the interstitial space, the mortar between the bricks it will be expanded and don't go anywhere. So it end up going out or spilling outwards and you see it outside. That is how T1 uh, mappings work. And this is how we can calculate the extracellular volume. So I think uh, I will end there for now. There are quite a few to talk about, but I think I'll end there for now. I think it's a bit, yeah, I'll end there now.